And I knew at that moment that I would never be back on that person's show again. Margaret, is the reverend sounding a little sexist or is it just me? Feminism has gained a foothold in many evangelical churches. Do you think and that's a good of, thing? No, I don't. Not at all. Why not? I would have to say the reverend is, is sounding a little um, questionable there. The culture doesn't dictate truth. The gospel dictates truth. My job is not to be a political pundit or political activist. My job is to be a pastor and proclaim the truth of the gospel. You're about to watch Vody Bokum completely stun these feminist women live on TV. Now, the conversation starts off with loads of agreement. <laughs> Very quickly, things start to change. So we're going to watch this. And then at the end, I'm going to give some of my thoughts as to why I think feminism is a cancer on the family. But let's dive in. And she could potentially lead a country, but she'd be banned from leading many congregations. So why does Sarah Palin seem to be winning over so many evangelicals? Let's bring in two people who may have some answers for us. Woody Bauckham is a pastor at Grace Family Baptist Church in Spring, Texas. And Margaret Feinberg is an evangelical speaker who lived in Alaska for five years and saw Palin get elected to governor. Good to see you both. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having me. Uh, Margaret, let's start with you. I want you both actually to touch on this quickly. Uh, why does her faith matter? Her faith matters because it says a lot about um, who she is as a person and her outlooks on life and the policies that will come to play in our nation. Reverend Bauckham? I agree completely. Uh, politi political ideology is really an outgrowth of our religious beliefs. You can't separate what a person believes from how a person will govern. So I think it's incredibly important that we know where people stand on religious issues. And, and here's what's interesting, Reverend Bauckham, she's winning over church members, uh, church leaders that don't even allow women uh, to preach at the pulpit, yet she could be leading the country. What do you make of that? <laughs> well, it's interesting. The bottom line on that is people look at this ticket and their fear is that we will have Barack Obama as our president, that we will be moved toward a socialist agenda, that we would have the most radically pro-abortion candidate ever to run for president to serve in that office. And that is an untenable position for evangelicals. And so they look at this and they're trying to decide this based on what's best for the nation in the here and now, and oftentimes overlooking some of those other issues. Do, do you think that that's something that, are you saying that should be, that shouldn't be overlooked? I mean, do you think that women in evangelical circles where women are not allowed uh, to preach, uh, let's say that Palin and McCain do win, and here you have this woman that could possibly be leading the free world, uh, and yet there's evangelicals voting for her that don't even believe that, that a woman should preach at the pulpit. Are, are, should, could this change the face of how evangelicals believe in the woman's role? I don't think it'll change the way evangelicals believe about women's roles. I think it's, it has sparked a discussion. And quite frankly, feminism has gained a foothold in many evangelical churches. Do you think and that's a good of, thing? No, I don't. Not at all. Why not? Uh, well, because we're about the gospel. The culture doesn't dictate truth. The gospel dictates truth. My job is not to be a political pundit or political activist. My job is to be a pastor and proclaim the truth of the gospel as clearly as I possibly can. Well, wait a minute. What about the Old Testament and, and the prophet Deborah? I mean, she was a political leader. She was a wife. She was a mother. She was one of the, the biggest forces in, in the book of Judges. So that's the gospel right there. Uh, she, she certainly was. And the fact that something happened doesn't mean that it's normative for the church. In Isaiah chapter 3, for example, one of the signs that a culture is under judgment is that women are in leadership in their nations. So Deborah was actually a sign that things were very bad in Israel, not a norm for the church. Margaret, I, I'm curious to see what you think about this and what the Reverend's saying. I think that that's a fair perspective, Vody, but I think we also need to look at Ephesians 5, which describes, you know, it's saying that husbands are to lay down their lives for their wives just as Jesus Christ laid down his life um, for the church. And in the same way, I think Todd has done an incredible job opening up the opportunity for Palin to use the gifts and the talents and the passions that she has been given in order to make a difference in her community and possibly in our nation and world on a significant political landscape and effect. Margaret, is the reverend sounding a little sexist or is it just me? 
<laughs> I would have to say the reverend is, is sounding a little um, questionable there. But in the sense that I believe that everyone, um, despite gender, has an opportunity to serve, to give, and to play a role in making a difference in their communities, in their churches, and around the world. Reverend, this could be an exciting time. I mean, this could break through. We're becoming progressive in so many ways. We're seeing a black man possibly winning the presidency. We're seeing a woman here that's uh, on the Republican ticket that, that's, you know, rousing up uh, evangelicals of possibly to think twice about the woman's role in the church. I mean, this is fascinating times. They are fascinating times, and they're also frightening times. When you see Margaret Feinberg you use Ephesians chapter 5, uh, which clearly says that a husband is the head of the wife in order to justify somehow with this sleight of hand that Palin's husband is laying down his life by allowing her to do that. Number one, she's playing fast and loose with the text. And secondly, she is also ignoring the fact that Palin's responsibility as a wife and mother is governed by scripture, not by whether we feel it's progressive in our culture. Margaret, final thought the, the, there. Lodi, I believe that's a narrow interpretation and a boxy interpretation of the text, as well as the role of women, who in today's working families, many families in the United States need both the man and the wife in order to work outside of the home, in order to support the family, and to put that kind of burden on the family, whereby a woman must stay at home, um, I just don't think that translates into many working class families today. You know, my job is not to translate into working class families. My job is to be honest with the text. And the text says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 5, a woman is to be the keeper of her home. Now, I will not violate the teaching of the text in order to somehow sound more appropriate for the culture. I am a herald of the truth of the gospel, and my job is to teach the gospel according to what the authors have said, not according to what I think the culture wants to hear. I think but Vodi, being a keeper of the home can be translated in so many different ways. And that means that if a woman happens to be the breadwinner, winner, shouldn't they have the opportunity to step out and take care of their family in that way? Listen. All right, what about the text that says the man and the woman should submit to one another? I think I'm just <laughs> going to leave it right there, folks. And I'm going to be studying the Bible tonight, <laughs> and I promise to bring you two back, especially as we see this go forward and seeing how evangelicals vote. Thank you so much, Margaret Feinberg and Reverend Bodie Bauckham. Thank you. All right, guys. So the CNN host says, what about that verse that says submitting to one another? And Margaret, the woman in green, she alluded to that passage when she said that Sarah Palin's husband was giving up his life, laying his life down by letting Sarah Palin run for vice president. But is that really what the scripture means? Let's dive in. So Ephesians 5, 21 says that we should be submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, there's obviously context that comes before. We'll get to that. And then verse 22, wives submit to your husbands. And verse 25 says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, how did Jesus give his life up for us? Did he give up his life by, did he lay his life down by saying, do you know what? I'm going to let you be in the driving seat. I'm going to let you be in the lead. If he did that, that would have meant we would be the ones to go on the cross. We would be the ones to rule over death we would be the ones to ascend to the right hand of the father no we we didn't we didn't do that <laughs> jesus did that because laying down your life giving himself up for his church for the church in this context is not about stepping into the back seat rather it's about stepping into the position of a servant leader of being the leader and we as the church yield our authority to him and this is exactly what Paul is telling wives to do to their husbands, to yield their authority to their husband as the husband sacrificially leads his wife. So no, it doesn't mean stepping back. But not only that, some would say, oh yeah, but verse 21 says that we should submit to one another. So that clearly disregards everything else it says about wives submitting to their husbands. It's a two-way street. But see, the problem with that is, again, when you actually read the Bible in its context and not just pull it apart to prove your point, you see that Paul is saying that Christians, spirit-filled Christians, should be submissive people. He says in verse 18 that we should not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. And then he gives us some examples of what being spirit-filled looks like. You address one another in Psalms, you give thanks always, and you submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But he doesn't stop there because he then gives three contexts for that submission. You see, wives submit to your husbands. Then you see, children obey your parents. Then you see, bond servants obey your masters. 
So it's clear who he's speaking to when he says submit. And in every instance, he gives the person that submits and the person who leads. And he always says, submit out of reverence for Christ, but lead with the love of Christ. So it's not an, it's not an excuse for husbands to be abusive. But it is making it very clear that in the Christian, in the family, God has designed it so that a wife would submit to her husband. That and that's so. I mean, that's just one example of how Christian feminists will try and use the scripture, but will abuse the scripture to justify what they're trying to do. And one of the problems with that is it's used to spread feminism, which again I said and I will say it till the day that I die: feminism is a cancer on the family. Feminism is not about equality between men and women. Feminism is not social progress. Feminism destroys the most fundamental institution that God has built, which is the family. And why is that? Well, firstly, because it encourages women to reject God's order for how families are meant to run with loving husbands who lead their family and powerful, supportive, yet submissive wives who follow their husband's leadership which leads to all sorts of argument and tension, anarchy in families. It leads to passive men and domineering women. It is a cancer. But not only that, because it tells women, feminism tells women that, do you know what's more important than your role as a mother? Your career, your personal liberation. It's about you and your power. So when the Bible says that women are to be trained by the older women, to love their husbands and children, be self-controlled and work at home. Instead, we've got a generation of older women, older feminists, telling women, nah, put your career over your kids. Put your career over your kids. So you've got women who are literally getting pregnant, giving birth, and then less than a month later, two months later, they're going straight back into the office and putting their child in daycare. And what does this mean? This means that pretty much throughout all of a child's life, they're constantly being trained by people other than the ones that God has designed for them to be trained by which is godly parents. In, in the book of Proverbs, Solomon is talking to his son and he says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Who teaches your child matters. And guess what? Before God created a school, God before God created a government, before God created anything, do you know what he created? He created a marriage, which led to a family. Why? Because God's desire is that godly people will come together in marriage have children and raise them to be godly people. And that is how the gospel would spread. So there's no surprise, no surprise that so many of the kids who grow up, go into school 30, 40 hours a week and go to church four, five hours a week are coming up 18, 19 years old and they're leaving the faith because they haven't been trained in it. They've been trained in a secular humanist education system. And we're surprised why they're leaving. And we think, oh, let's just put on some youth events. No, <laughs> they needed godly parenting. They needed more of their parents' time. And now this doesn't mean that women should just be the ones that stay at home and dads can go off work 100 hour weeks. Of course not. Of course not. The Bible says that it's actually the fathers who should lead in this. Fathers to bring up their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So even if it was Sarah Palin's husband who was running for vice president at the time, they had five children and some of the children were young. So it would have been wrong for them, for him too, to spend, let his career absorb all of his time at the expense of his children. And this doesn't mean that women just have to be stay at home moms and can't do anything apart from looking after the children. Just look at how Proverbs 31 describes a, a model woman. She looks well off, off to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She's not lazy. Her children rise up and call her blessed. And then just above, there's all sorts of stuff about what she does. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. She's active, she's busy, but the key thing is she's present in her home. And the problem with many modern families is that the way that we work, we go off to these far offices, we drive miles, we do all these business events, and we're barely ever at home. And our children suffer. And our children then grow up with all these secular humanist ideas and values. And then the faith the, Christ, the church declines and our churches are losing the young people and losing the young people and losing the young people. And then we complain that our society is getting godless and godless. But why were we allowing a godless world to educate our children? And a lot of this is down to feminism. Feminism has been behind a lot of this. And one of the core principles of feminism is that all distinctions should be leveled. 
all distinctions should be leveled between men and women. There's no difference. And in and feminism is an offshoot of communism. The idea that everything belongs to everyone. So your children are not just your children; they're our children. And if you look at some early feminists like Alexandra Kollontai from Russia, they will say you'll see them say these very things. This is why I say it is a cancer on the family. So you know, I admire, I, I praise God for for one of the things my wife and I were aligned on was our vision and values for the family. And I thank God for that. I encourage any of my brothers, any man who's looking to get married these days, if you are, if you care about having a godly family that holds fast to Christ, if the woman puts her career over kids, don't wife her. Don't wife her. Don't do it. But you yourself, if you put career over kids, you, got, you, have, you have to look in the mirror. We have to do better if we want our children to hold fast to God's word and God's truth. And I love that pastors like Vody Bokum were out there fighting the cause from early and hopefully CNM will have him back so they can finish off that conversation. Let me know what you think. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one. Peace and blessings.